OHUD consultant that has worked in the Chicago land area. Um, Gerald, if you want to introduce yourself, I definitely have a few questions that I'd like to go through with you, but tell us a little bit about yourself and thank you for joining okay. us today. Thanks for having me. Once again, my name is Gerald Stewart. I am a general contractor by trade for 36 years. And I've been a HUD consultant um, a little bit over 20 years now. I've been working with Christine and her team for roughly 14 years. Um, so I'm here today to help answer some questions and uh, give all the input I can to give you some guidance on the different loans and the different products that Chris is sharing with you today. Great, so first question for you, we'll just fire away. Is the HUD consultant the same as a home inspector and do I need both? Yeah, so good question. Um, we are two different professionals. Um, the difference between a home inspector and a HUD consultant is a home inspector is going to go around, check outlets, open up windows, check appliances. They're looking at the foundation walls, the structure of the home. Um, they're going to identify deficiencies and write in their report that things need to be further investigated by whatever trade that that repair would refer to. Whereas a HUD consultant, <clears throat> depending on whether it's a 203K or a, a home style loan, their report will talk about the repairs and price out what's the material and labor needed to make those repairs and as well as explain how the repairs will be made. So there's a big difference um, from the aspect of how the reports are written and how the reports are used. As far as whether you need a home inspector or not, um, when you're buying a home that you're not doing a total gut rehab on, it's good to have a home inspector because if you're doing a home style, you're not coming in looking at things. You're really walking through with your consultant saying, hey, I'd like to address this here bathroom, this kitchen. Maybe we want to, we want to do a patio. Maybe we want to, you know, add a new bathroom, uh, what have you. Um, whereas as we walk through if you want us to point things out, we will look at the deficiencies deficiencies within the property and point them out. But that's not typically part of a home style report because you have pretty much no mandatory repairs other than things such as lead-based paint, asbestos. You have to have a working kitchen, bathroom, a roof on the house for the home style loans. Whereas a 203K, we have what's called property uh, minimum property standards that have to be met. And that could be um, as little as a trip hazard and a sidewalk that you think is a little thing, but HUD looks at it as it as a safety hazard, broken window panes, uh, outlets that are non-conforming GFCI outlets. Um, so there's a list of things that go on handrails, at staircases. So there's multiple things when we get into an FHA loan that have to be pointed out and brought up to a certain standard, whereas the home styles, you have more flexibility to say, well, I think I want to do it, but I think I'll hold off on it for later. My main concerns are my kitchen, my bathroom, and maybe a new driveway. So. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. So mm -hmm. that's great input. If you're doing a gut rehab, you definitely don't need a home inspection. But like you said, if you're just doing some minor things, it's probably good to get both. How long does a HUD consultant appointment take, Gerald? That's that's a question I get often. A typical inspection takes between an hour to hour and a half. They can go longer. They can go up to two hours, two and a half hours. It just depends on the condition of the property, the size of the property, and if there's a lot of back and forth with conversation. Um, and if people are chiming in, trying to make decisions and they can't make decisions and then other people want to cast their input, it can it can kind of you know extend the time of a typical inspection, but roughly they take an hour to hour and a half. No, that's great. So if people, you know, if they're on the call and they get, you know, go to make an appointment, they know what to do there. Are you, I think you get this question a lot, are you my GC? So, you know, you're coming out there, they call you and then they realize you're a GC or they think a consultant is a GC and that we have to use you as a GC. Can you clarify, are you the GC on the project? Yep, I'm absolutely never the GC. It's a conflict of interest. I can't be the GC and the consultant. Um, but I get asked that question quite often as we're going through the process. We might be 
quarter of the way into it, halfway through, near the end, and then the question comes, are you going to give us a bid too? And the answer is no, but I'm going to give you a, a complete detailed report that's going to price out everything that we discuss material and labor wise that you can use um, to gauge where your other, you know, contractors will bid the, the project and you'll know whether their numbers are in line or not. Okay. What's the difference between a 203K write up and the home style write up, just briefly? Yep. Pretty much the mandatory repairs. Okay. Uh, the minimum property standards that HUD puts out that have to be met is, is what really distincts the difference between the two. Yeah, because HUD has a little bit, guys, HUD is a government-backed program that we keep talking about. They have a little bit higher standards of the property versus our conventional loan. So that makes sense. How long does it take to receive the work right up from you, Gerald, like once they have the appointment scheduled with you? Yep, so the reports take one week. So if we met today on Wednesday, your report is due back the following week on Wednesday. A lot of times I meet with people on Wednesday and I'm getting text messages, phone calls, Friday afternoon, Saturday saying, oh, my realtor wanted to know if the report is ready. I make it very clear with every client, the report takes one week. There's no exception. There's no 24, 48 hour turnaround. Um, there's a lot of details that go into these reports. They have to be accurate. Uh, because they're going to be looked at by multiple parties and multiple contractors. So, I'll, you know, I take pride in making sure we detail everything to its fullest. Yeah, and I'll show an example of that in a minute. Are you the appraiser and will you tell me my uh, property is appraised value? I, I think you get that a lot. So let's get that one a lot too. Yep, I do. Uh, I'm not an appraiser. I don't comment on what the house is worth. I don't even know what the homes are being purchased for half the time unless I look it up online, which I'm not taking time to look it up because it, it doesn't affect what I do. Um, and, and as far as the work that you're doing, um, how does that affect your appraisal? Uh, I can give you some insight that kitchens and bathrooms help your appraisals. Uh, bedroom counts help your appraisals. If you're reducing bedrooms, reducing bathrooms, it hurts your appraisal. Um, when clients wanna say, well, we wanna build out our basement and do all these fancy things and make it nice. Um, it doesn't help your appraisal as far as the values go if your upstairs is where your work really needs yeah. to be performed. Well, and I want to I want to actually add to that. You know, I recently had a client who was had a ranch home and the basement, and they were going to like dig out the basement. Like the this whole basement project would have been over a hundred thousand dollars. You get maybe ten to fifteen thousand dollars of value on a finished basement, even if you dig it out. So then they realized they needed to go up. To be even be able to do it so i mean that's that's great input because i get so many people who are like oh we're going to dig out the basement i'm like no you're not <laughs> it is doesn't make sense so thanks for that input um mm -hmm. all right so how does a change order work during construction i explained that we have that contingency reserve you know can you explain like how change orders work and you know the contingency reserve people think you know can i use it for anything i want so it's kind of a combined question if you want to go through that a little bit i appreciate it so the contingency reserves are set, are set aside for unforeseen conditions. Once the loan closes, the GC goes in, they begin to perform the demolition. Maybe they open up the bathroom floor, they realize there's termite damage, rotted subfloor, maybe there's studs in the walls, maybe there's no insulation in the walls. These are conditions that have to be addressed to meet safety and health issues within the property. Those then would be uh, considered viable change orders where the contractor would write up on their letterhead and say replace three floor joists, install you know 60 square feet of subfloor, cost $1,200. That change order would be submitted to the consultant. The consultant then would write up a change order on the necessary forms that the bank requires or the the type of loan program that you're going through, whether it's a uh, home style or 203k there's different forms for different loans and we would submit that back for signature and forward it to the lender for pre-approval every change order is required to have a pre-approval so that you know the contractor is going to be paid for that those repairs we run into situations where the clients close the loan and they then want to say well now we're going to take our fifteen thousand dollars in contingency we're going to put up a, a new fence in the backyard or we're going to build a deck 
Well, we have to pump the brakes twice because the project has not gotten 50, 60 percent completed. So we don't know if the electrical, the plumbing, the HVAC system is all up and running. You know, the demo is done. The rough carpentry is done and there's no need for that contingency. If we get to the point where you have funds available after the project has passed those minimum uh, repairs, then those change orders for upgrades can be added. You may add recessed can lights, add that fence, add that deck, but they will not be approved until we get to a certain point within that project. Great. So can you explain a couple of things when we talk to FHA and Homestyle that there are differences and we keep saying HUD minimum standards. That to me and you is normal language, but a lot of our clients on the call, if they're doing FHA, well, what is a HUD minimum standard? If I'm doing an FHA loan, you know, what do I need to like think about if I walk into a home that is a, a minimum standard? I know there's some really quick ones you could address. Maybe mm -hmm. mention a few of those. Yep. Some of the main ones uh, would be broken window panes, outlets that are two prong outlets that should be grounded three prong outlets, uh, handrails at staircases, uh, walkways, your sidewalks have trip hazards where the concrete is raised more than three quarters of an inch, or there's a hole in the sidewalk that could, you know, be a, a place where a woman is walking and her heel gets stuck in the sidewalk. Uh, those are all safety concerns. Um, one of the biggest things that we run into with FHA loans in some of the older buildings in the city is you find space heaters. You walk in and you'll see a space heater in the dining room or maybe in the kitchen and there's no other heating source in any of the bedrooms. And they walk in and say, oh, well, we're just gonna put in a new space heater. Well, on an FHA loan, it requires sufficient heat source in every room of the house. So, you would have to do one of two things, either put in a new furnace with ductwork and have a heat source in every bedroom or remove those space heaters as well and put electric baseboard heat or radiant heat in each room. So those are some of the big things when we get an FHA, uh, the electrical and the heating are the, are the main ones that we run into. Okay. Um, once we close, what are the next steps or like going into being like, if I tell my client, Hey, we're clear to close next week and you're going to close. I always suggest they call you right away to try to maybe get a call at the GC to talk about that first material draw. But are there any tips that you can tell people? That's our, my last question for you. And then we'll open it up, um, to questions. Yeah, we, we recommend when you have a closing date, uh, you reach out, send an email to your consultant to your uh, contractor, particularly your contractor, because they need to know that you're closing on the 15th or the 28th of the month. So they can look at their schedule and be better prepared to now start placing you within their schedule so you can get the job off to a good start, as well as if there's an architect involved with your file, then you have to get the architect to start uh, with the full set of drawings that would be needed for permitting purposes. Um, that's one of the biggest uh, setbacks is permitting. Um, when you're doing major renovation work, um, not only do we need a sketch when you change bathroom counts or room counts for the appraisers, pre-appraisal, uh, pre um, but once you close the loan, those drawings have to be executed to obtain your actual building permit so the contractor can start the work. A lot of times the clients are like, well, can't you start without the permits? And the answer to that is no. Once you close the loan, you're gonna receive a welcome email or, or email from a draw specialist that's assigned to your file through guaranteed rate. And I would be on the email, the contractor would be on the email, all the necessary parties explaining to you what the next steps are as well. And they're gonna say, do not start any work without permits. Uh, contact your consultant with any change orders, schedule right. all inspections with your consultant. So we double and triple uh, kind of overlay things just so people stay on track and they, they have something to follow because otherwise we've had clients close, not say a word, 
and they're just thinking everyone knows that the closing took place. Right. And the contractor gets a call two months later saying, have you started? And they're like, we didn't know you closed. So it's communication is everything. Okay, no, that's great. I appreciate that. And I'm not sure if I'm blowing this up a little bit. This is a write-up that, you know, a sample write-up that you would get from the consultant. Uh, this one's 21 pages long. It's, I think, around $230,000. But as you can see, it's super detailed. Like he starts here with the masonry and tuck pointing, goes into some soffit and fascia repair, but there's detail on every single item, you know, gutters, downspouts, roof talks about material and labor. It's broken out like that. It says what you're doing, you know, to tear off, you know, what, what's happening, what they should be using. So it's very detailed. So it doesn't leave a lot of room for misunderstandings. You know, that's one of the things when I'll get some renovation, you know, loans coming in, the client will be like, oh, I have a GC bid. And it's a one page narrative, like, hey, we're going to redo your house for 200,000. And it's on one page with no definition. Well, what are you getting for that? So this is required because of the detail. So again, you can see there's a lot of detail here, you know, sidewalks, the depth, you know, the, the fiber reinforced concrete very very detailed so when gerald says these reports take a week and people are like well, what takes a so long it's the detail the attention to detail is so critical with these properties and trying to cover everything so that there's no confusion because the biggest things that come out of if you hire your own contractor and i've, I've even done it you know i've had some of my own jobs that that i've had and i'm like well i thought you said that no no no, no that's not what i meant you know we didn't write it down perfectly this hopefully will eliminate any you know, confusion, misunderstanding from you and the contractor. This report is invaluable. You get this version, you get two attachments when your appointment is done one week later. There's one called an SOR, specification of repair. This is the one with the number. So you and I have our first look at how much this is gonna cost. And this page, this is the page that I always go to, page 21. This is the recap of everything you're doing. And I start to look at this construction cost total. Is that what we were thinking? You know, then I look at, is there an architect? Are these fees what I was thinking? And I call you and I'm like, okay, this came in. We thought this would be 200,000, it's 233. Do you want to cut back some material costs? Maybe get it to 215 and then we can move forward. Then there's a blank version that you give to your contractors. It's exactly this, but blank and the contractor fills in his write-up. Why we do that is to, to get an idea of what his costs are, because typically they should be similar to what we think they're going to be. We've had a project where the cost should have been one, I think 135 and the GC bid came in at 250. It didn't make sense. We would never lend, lend out at that. And at the end, the client got a GC to do it for 145. Now, if we weren't involved, he would have thought he needed to pay 250. So it's a protective measure to you know, the clients as well. So it's a great um, thing to have, but we're gonna open it up to some questions. I did see 